Our next talk, our next speaker, Daniel Nägele, he will talk also about some very interesting stuff. Daniel, the stage is yours. A warm welcome to Daniel, please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Daniel. I work at uh, Bellevue, which is the state-level research and education network of Baden-Württemberg. Um, and I'm also assigned to the BWNet project, which uh, is concerned with bridging uh, research with operations. So bring some innovation into research. That's the other way around. Bring some innovation into operations and uh, crown the research folks in uh, yeah, operations, basically. Um, yeah, I don't... I think I can uh, catch up some time here. Um, I don't have to talk to you about the importance of flow monitoring, what you can do with it. You can find new peerings on interfaces. You can derive flow spec rules for DOS traffic if you receive that. Um, you can do many awesome things with flows, but the question often is how do we do this and uh, what the actual problems we face are. Um, yeah. The problems include that we require some vantage points. If we want to do peering analysis, we'll have to look at the interfaces where we do actual peering. We can't do that at customer ports. The other way around, if you want to have some cons uh, security considerations, we will need to look at customer interfaces because we can hardly look at all the flows on a 100 gigabit or more interface. Um, there's also different formats and hardware limitations. We had some of that uh, yesterday too, I think. Um, where vendors have wildly different uh, fields in their flows, where they don't fill out stuff. There's sometimes even difference in different uh, versions of the same vendor, like iOS XR has some uh, weird stuff going on between versions. Um, yeah, and what the reality in uh, networks often looks like, and I hope I can call some of you out here, um, is that there's a Samplicator instance somewhere, and that's sending spoofed UDP traffic out to different applications that all parse the same NetFlow data and uh, duplicate that work of parsing the data. Um, but as I said, um, what we've been doing and how we try to uh, solve this uh, multiple parsing problem um, is to um, focus, focus on um, application layer flow processing basically. So what we're trying to do is we want to separate our flow streams based on the criteria within the flows. So while the samplicator only can reassign flows from routers to different uh, applications, we want to have a scenario where we can take flows from one router and separate that, like take half of the flows, put them into an application um, where that specific subset of flows is relevant. Um, we also want to have enrichments for flows that are uh, yeah, important and drop our noise early. There's loads of flows that nobody will ever raise an eyebrow for. Um, but on the other hand, there's the subset of flows that really matters to many applications. Um, we also wanted uh, multi-tenant support, which is uh, basically another way of saying stream separation, because we want to separate the stream for our different customers. Um, and basically have, uh, them, uh, have them have access to their own flows because we only have access to like the full feed on the router. Um, so we want to separate that. And also um, we have to unify different flow sources and different flow granularities. So we might have flows that include routing information. That's our, the border routers. We have other flows that don't include any flow, uh, any routing information. We might have flows that are sampled at a very high rate, others are maybe one to one, and we want to be able to integrate that as best as possible. So yeah, um, what we've been working on for the last year is what we call the flow pipeline tooling. Um, it's open source, first of all. Um, you won't get a link now, the link is at the end, so you don't look at it now. <laughs> And um, it's a single dependency-free binary, basically, that's working in a completely configuration-defined way. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see what these configurations might look like. Um, we have a list of segments, basically. It's done in YAML. And um, usually, you'll start with some kind of input, do something with the flows, 
and then yeah, do something else with them. <laughs> um, each of these segments acts on a single protobuf encoded flow message, so you can have um, the segments do things on individual flows, but also keep counters, uh, fill data structures, whatever. Um, yeah, and there's many different segments available for that. So um, in the following some minutes, I will go into how uh, we are using this to uh, tackle the problems we face as a, I don't know, mid-sized service provider, um, and um, what we are up to. But first, where do these flow messages come from? So I told you about the input segments. They have to come from somewhere. Um, the most important uh, input that we are using is uh, the GoFlow2 segment. Um, I guess most people know GoFlow by now. Um, it's a Go tool that's parsing all the relevant flow formats um, directly from an interface and usually writes them into a Kafka cluster. Um, what we're doing here, we are just using the API to uh, get at these flows and we can do anything within our pipeline with those flows. But we also have a, a Kafka segment. Um, if you were to make a flow pipeline that's just one segment GoFlow as an input and has Kafka producer as an output, you would have an identical GoFlow2 instance basically. Um, but we are also able to um, receive flows from a Kafka here. So what we can do, we can use the same pipeline we had uh, collecting our flows, like with GoFlow, something else, something else. Um, we can just use the Kafka consumer at the start of that pipeline and do all the same things that we were doing live on our flows. So what I'm trying to say here, they can be pre-filtered or pre-enriched. They can be, I don't know, anything really. Um, so yeah, that's basically the in and out of the flows we provide. Lastly, and um, I won't be able to go into detail in this talk about this, um, we also have a segment um, that's using eBPF to dump packet headers and pass those into flows. Um, there are some weird configurations um, with having a, a model of a flow cache in memory to best uh, emulate what, con uh, what vendors are doing on the routers. I mean, there's different cache sizes, there's different sampling methods, there's all of these things, and um, to have comparable flows in the end from eBPF and also from your routers, um, there's some uh, trickery involved to get that on a statistically comparable level. On the other hand, there's uh, interesting things to be done with eBPF. We can get information that's not part of the usual NetFlow standard, um, such as pack packet inter-arrival times, um, fancy TCP headers, whatever um, it is you need, basically. Um, and with that, um, I have my first example. You can get used to those boxes. Um, on the left-hand side, we have a router that's exporting NetFlow in some format. Um, we have a flow pipeline process that's um, listening for that flow traffic, for that flow dump, and um, we are then writing that into a Kafka cluster. The configuration in this example is just the GoFlow segment I told you about, um, a add CID segment that's just doing prefix uh, matching and writing a customer ID into this flow. Lastly, we have the Kafka producer segment, and with that we have what basically is a GoFlow instance that's doing one enrichment step in the process. Um, if you're not seeing why this is like special, um, what we're able to do now is that we can take flows from different routers in different formats. Um, the segment will open more ports and listen for that. And what we're able to do is we not only can write one stream with the customer ID set into that one stream, but we can write an arbitrary number of streams that are splitted or separated on that criteria that we chose, like the customer ID in this case. So what we would be able to do is like we can give customer one access to his stream, his topic of Kafka um, with some ACL stuff and uh, authentication stuff, of course, and um, have them do their own flow pipeline work, like enrich it further with their internal information, such as what is their sub 
nothing like inside the organization that we as a provider can't see or just, I don't know, dump it to their favorite time series database, generate research data sets and so on. So everything that I will tell you about in this talk is also uh, able, is also doable by any of our customers because we have a topic per customer, so we're full multi-tenant and all of this applies at any level, basically. Um, I already started with the first um, enrichment thing. We've built that into the pipeline so that we can go ahead and filter on all of these data points. So the prefix tagging, um, we've used that in this slide before to add a customer ID to a flow based on the prefix that the flow originated or uh, terminated in. Um, we can also add BGP data. I will go into this like immediately. And um, later on, we'll also see something about uh, anonymization and filtering, but there's more, basically. So we can use DNS to enrich flows, we can use SNMP, we can use all the fancy things that you can think up, basically. Um, to go straight into the BGP segment, um, in this case, I've just repeated uh, what we've been doing some slides ago. We have a router that's exporting NetFlow again, and we use the GoFlow segment to uh, receive that. We have a BGP segment added, um, and that's opening a BGP session with the router that's exporting. So if there's multiple exporting routers, it will have multiple, it will have to have multiple BGP sessions going on so that we can get this routing info from any of the routers. You could probably do that also with some route server, but um, it's most convenient to just check out the sampler address that is part of every flow and use the associated um, BGP session to get that data. And again, we have a Kafka producer that we can just use to dump all the flows, the full stream, into a Kafka topic. That's including the BGP info. Um, what we can do with that? Um, we're now using another flow pipeline. We could also do that in the same flow pipeline. So um, it's just for brevity's sake that I um, didn't include the GoFlow and the BGP segment here again. Just imagine this Kafka cluster on the top left is the flow stream from the previous slide. We can go ahead and filter for anything that we want. In this case, I've chosen to filter on RPK valid uh, flows only, and um, we are just printing that. I know the network engineers love their CLI tools, so we of course have a printer too. And yeah, what we can do, we can just change the filter to anything that we want. We could filter for invalids, um, which would yield nothing in our case, um, but um, you could use that to check before you enable uh, dropping invalids, for instance. Um, you can also check uh, what ASNs your traffic is passing through downstream. This is basically a AS path matcher. You could check the local pref, um, you could do whatever. Instead of using this plain text filtering, you could also filter in some statistical way. I'm not going to go into that either, but you can have segments that only uh, use the, the biggest flows basically based on a set window size, for instance. Um, yeah, this flow filter is also a part of uh, what we developed ourselves. It's loosely based around BPF. Um, and it's uh, yeah, imagined in a way that you can just write whatever comes to your mind and it should probably work if you ever worked with um, yeah, traffic filtering or flow filtering before. Um, you will see more of that on later slides. Um, if we get to the point where we want to do something useful with flows that we are splitting, separating into streams, aggregating, filtering, whatever, um, we get into the territory where we have different exporters. Um, so we can use a SQLite segment to get a full dump of flows. Um, we can use that, for instance, to do post-mortem analysis if we had some denial of service attack and we just want to get our traffic to disk fast. Um, and we can check that out later. Or we can use a Prometheus segment that's just opening a port with an exporter on it and uh, just outputting what uh, metrics they are gained using the labels. So you have the labels on the right hand side um, which are included. Um, and yeah, that's working quite well. I will go into the Prometheus segment in a second. 
Uh, lastly, you could also write it to ClickHouse. Um, that's right now only supporting uh, different profiles or presets. Um, I'm going for multiple community tools that I can feed from the flow pipeline directly, so you don't have to need, have to use their own collection. So, as I said in the beginning, we want to get rid of having the samplicator instance that's just splitting up the raw net flow, but rather we can feed our tools directly from this flow pipeline. Um, and with that, um, we're going to talk some more about the Prometheus segment, basically. Um, as you can see here, all of the segments are fully transparent for flows. So you can chain inputs together, outputs together, you can chain these exporters together, and um, it still works. You could also go ahead and have multiple Prometheus segments, for instance, and all the flows will traverse all of these segments, and you can have different um, exporters on the same set of flows. So you could, in theory, go ahead and have one exporter doing this uh, peering analysis thing uh, that we also have on the right hand side where you print ASNs. Um, you could but also do, I don't know, some distribution over protocols if that's something you can need, uh, you need in your NOC. I don't know. Um, it's really uh, limitless what you are able to do with uh, this kind of configuration. Um, to have some pretty graphs as well. Um, this is uh, the dashboard we can gain from previous Prometheus segment uh, configuration. It's just um, we pick one interface, in this case it's an IX interface, and uh, we just check out what are the source ASN, the destination ASNs, um, and plot that. And if we were concerned about the utilization of that Stuttgart IX interface, um, if that was about to be full or was already full, we could go ahead, set up a private peering with whatever the green AS is and uh, immediately free ourselves from these gigabits. So um, there are some very concrete applications, but as I said, I probably don't need to tell you about the importance of flows. Um, we can also use the same tool for some uh, security and uh, denial of service considerations. So a common scenario is, um, for us at least, is that some customer has some uh, denial of service things going on and we want to find out um, who the recipient is so we can remotely trigger a black hole with our upstreams so that the denial of service ends. Um, what, uh, what turned out to be a, a common use case in our NOC is um, having a live view of the flows that we are having coming in. So we connect to this uh, Kafka cluster that we have running on standby at all times, basically. All our flows from our borders are already there, and we just consume the stream of flows and filter that uh, for whatever we think might be going on. It's pretty easy to see. If you have this print flow dump segment uh, on the right-hand side, it's pretty easy to see in this TCP dump style uh, yeah, list what is going on and if there's a overly uh, large number of UDP stuff going on with weird ports, um, you would probably apply this filter really fast where you just check out the proto UDP and some source port, in this case uh, NTP, and go ahead and also include the fragmented datagrams, which will probably turn out to be some amplification attack. Um, lastly, we have this segment called Top Talkers. Um, it's very easy, it just takes the destination IP addresses and uh, yeah, sums up traffic over those in a set window size again and uh, we will get the correct destination, the correct uh, recipient IP address very easily with that. This obviously has also some limits um, because if we go ahead and have a small customer that's getting a denial of service attack, it probably won't register in the larger interfaces that we have in our network, which are the ones that are actually exporting the NetFlow data. So um, in this case, we could go ahead and change up the head of the pipeline and just enable IPFIX on this customer's port um, and exchange the Kafka consumer segment for a GoFlow segment. In that case, we can just use the same tail of the pipeline and do all the same things again, use the same toolings, add segments on demand, whatever. Um, I also take the liberty to exchange the, uh, the uh, filter example I made here. 
Um, I adjusted it to detect syn flooding in this case. Um, and we can also check whether our mitigations are working because NetFlow by default includes dropped flows. Um, there's been a li uh, little anecdote in Pavel's talk yesterday about the uh, drop status in Cisco devices. Um, we've dealt with that here for you, but um, yeah, we can look into a traffic that we're dropping, although we can't tell whether it's been dropped by a BGP flow spec tool. So um, you would have to check that out uh, yourself. Um, we're still a research project in BWNet, so an important thing for us is also having uh, data sets, comparable data sets, and also uh, uh, labeled data sets. So if we were to uh, look into this uh, denial of service thing that we just did, um, we could go ahead and just while we are doing this debugging process, while we are figuring out which flows to drop on our upstream, to black hole on our upstreams, um, we can go ahead and just append um, the f these two segments. Um, in this case, we're anonymizing the IP addresses involved, um, specifically source and destination addresses. It's reversible, so uh, we could, in theory, find out concrete addresses uh, to identify culprits, for instance, if it wasn't distributed. Um, and we can create um, different data sets based on um, the result of this flow filter segment again. So we can insert the yellow part and check whether these flows were dropped. Um, and we will get, um, among the usual drops that we have with ACLs and stuff, um, we will get um, the uh, drops that we added with our mitigation. So we can have a CSV file uh, for our researchers. For some reason, researchers love CSV files. And um, we can also have the rest of our traffic in a other file so they can feed it to their algorithms, to their learning systems, and so on. We can also use different uh, segments, of course. It doesn't have to be the CSV one. Um, we can do this during the live example, as I said. And still, we can chain segments together, so we can use different uh, segments at the same time. So we could also use SQLite to dump that. We could also use some other database to dump that. We could generate our favorite time series with the appropriate labels at the same time. So um, yeah, lastly, um, I managed to quite catch up a bit. So it's time for questions. Perfect. Um, um, the extensibility and integration of the tool. Um, we are using the Go plugin system. So um, it's very easy to just uh, go ahead and write your own algorithms, write your own tooling um, into the existing pipeline. You can implement whatever you want. You can use experimental data structures. You can adapt your favorite database. You can add a schema for your favorite tool to some existing segment, whatever. And all of that is completely pluggable into the existing uh, yeah, segment infrastructure, basically. Um, what you can do is you code in a provided template or use any stock segment that we already coded. Um, in the bottom, you can see what that would look like. It's just reading from a channel. You get a flow message and you output it again if you don't want to filter it. If you want to filter the flow, you don't output the flow. Easy. Um, you have to compile it using the build mode plugin and then you're already done, basically. You can launch that single binary that I told you about with the minus P flag, which is including a shared object, and you can use the segment that you defined in your shared object. You can use multiple of those, so if you want to have a pipeline made up only of your custom segments, that's also possible. It's more of a framework, really. And with that, um, I'm ready for your questions. Thanks for attention, and uh, the link is on the right-hand side. You may click it now. Thank you, Daniel. Big applause for this talk. Are there any questions? Yes, our audio angel is running. Ah, the power angel. Um. Hi, my name is Rolf. Um, thank you very much. It was a very nice and, uh, and interesting um, presentation. You mentioned an eBPF program, and uh, but only once. 
So um, maybe I misunderstood, but you said it is consuming flows and is producing some sort of enhanced flow export information. Is that what, what it's doing? Um, not really. It's um, dumping the packet headers from a socket filter program and um, using that to feed a flow cache. In turn, that cache can output the flow format that we are using um, internally, basically. We can also um, use that to get additional data points that are not part of any flow uh, standard, like IPFIX is the only one standardized, I think, and not made up by a vendor. And um, we can add different fields to that. So if you wanted to have packet into arrival times, or I don't know, look at this specific TCP header that some researcher came up with to do some fancy Stau uh, control. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, then we can include that into this flow message. So it's not doing any dropping or anything, it's just generating flows from the packet headers. Right, but but you, you, you need to feed it the, the actual traffic? Yes, of or course, like you need to see the actual traffic. You right. could do that on your firewall, if you have a Linux firewall or something like that. Um, you can do it in your data center. We have uh, Kubernetes uh, pods for that where you can just integrate it in your network environment there if you use Kubernetes. Um, so it's easy-ish to include, um, but of course you have to have it in your data path. And, and it's available also? It's also available, yes. All right, excellent, thank you. Thanks for these questions. Are there other questions? Are there questions from the internet? No questions from the internet. The internet is not for questions. Then, Perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you again.